I just want to thank everyone for coming out here tonight. I want to thank all the honorees tonight, uh, Angelica, Cheryl, um, who inspired me years ago when, uh, with Watermelon Women, Sean for your um, amazing uh, comments earlier today, uh, Jeffrey Wallace for the work that you've done, and Jason Adair, and Jason and Adair for the work that you two have done. Uh, you've all inspired me, inspired so many people in this room. I also have to say a word of thanks to Jared. I met Jared at the 2016 Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. I was walking down one of the aisles and Jared called out to me. I had no idea who he was. And we started talking and I realized, oh, you're the guy. You're the guy <laughs> who, uh, he was actually the one who became famous for busting Melania Trump uh, when she plagiarized Michelle Obama's words. <laughs> So needless to say, we became very close friends. <laughs> and we've worked together closely on several projects over the, year, over the years right now, and um, I'm honored and pleased that he's here today to present this award as well. And Renee, thank you very much for that. I want to thank my close friends who are here today, my friend Neil, my best friend Neil, who came all the way from Oakland, California to, to attend this event. Uh, my cousin, Carice, who's sitting next to me as well, uh, from St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I'm from. St. Louis! St. Louis. Yeah. Um, my ex, Nathan, is out here. <laughs> I have to always salute Nathan uh, for the work that we did together on the reality show years ago. And um, Henry Gilmore, Henry, I know you're here somewhere. Henry called me up and asked me uh, if I'd be willing to be honored. And I was thinking, who would not want to be honored uh, in an award ceremony like this? Uh, so thank you, Henry, and to Scott and Vincent, and to Better Brothers LA, and everyone who was a part of making this event happen. You know, um, we are now at a pivotal point, a juncture, if you will, in the changing of America. According to the Census Bureau, by 2044, whites will no longer be the majority in this country. And the, it, it, the, tra the, the thing about this is that a lot of people are very unhappy about that. And everything you see that's going on in the country today, all the politics that you see, all the hatred and division, all the attempts to separate us, to prevent people from being empowered, to stop them from voting, to stop them from being enfranchised, all of that is because of that one fact, that people are afraid of the majority, the current majority of the country is afraid of losing its majority status. So in the context of a world that is increasingly changing, it is important that we be visible. It is important that we not be afraid to be who we are. Women are the majority of the population in this country. We've never, women, let me say it again, women are the majority of the population of this country. And we've never had a woman president. We've had one African American president, and that scares the hell out of a lot of people because there's a fear that there may be another or others coming down, down in the future. White men are 29% of the population. White men are 29% of the population. White men are 29% of the population. And yet they are 98% of all the presidents of the United States and 100% of all the vice presidents of the United States in our entire country's history. It is a problem. But now we have a country where we've had a black president, we've had women and people of color who run for office, we have marriage equality in all 50 states, and we have change that is happening, and that change scares people. So our very presence here today is a threat to people who are afraid of that change. But let me tell you something. There is hope, there is hope, and I can tell you from my personal story why I believe in this hope. I remember when I came out years ago in 1991, as a 25-year-old law student at Harvard, and I went to a bookstore in the Harvard bookstore community area, and I remember looking nervously on the shelves of the 
counters trying to find a book in the LGBT section that spoke to me. I read through a few pages of the books that I saw and found a book that, that worked, I thought, and took the book to the counter and purchased it and put it in my backpack and took it home. And I read that entire book that night. And immediately after reading that book, I came out to myself. The very next day, I came out to my mother. I called her up in Colleen, Texas, dialed the numbers of, digits of her phone number, and she didn't answer because I hung up before she could get to the phone. So I took a deep breath and called again. And again, I couldn't allow myself to make the call, so I hung up before she could answer. And this was in the days before caller ID, so she had no idea who was calling. So finally, I, put out, I pulled out a pen and paper, and I wrote down the pen and paper everything I wanted to say to my mom in this conversation. And I wrote down everything I wanted her to say to me in response. And only when I had that script in my hand was I able to place that phone call. My mom answered the phone, we spoke, and somewhere in the midst of a very normal conversation, I said, you know, Mom, I have something I want to tell you. And when you say that, you can't just talk about the weather or something trivial. So I took another deep breath, and I said, I hope this doesn't change the way you think about me, but I want you to know something. I want you to know that I'm gay. The silence was the reaction that, met, uh, that my mom responded with. There was nothing said for several moments, and then finally she spoke up and she said, I love you. And that was the most important thing she could have said at that moment because for me it was an expression of unconditional love that even though she didn't fully understand what I was saying, she was willing to express to her son that she loved him in this time of need. When I was reaching out to her for affirmation and support, she was telling me that she loved me. And I know she didn't understand everything because she asked questions. She said, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. She said, well, maybe you just haven't met the right woman yet. I said, no, I don't think that's it. She said, was it something I did? I said, no, it's nothing you did or did not do. This is just who I am. And my mom gave me some great advice. She said, I love you and I support you, but don't tell too many people about this. And especially don't tell your grandmother, because it'll just kill your grandmother if she finds out about it. So I remembered when I was very young, my mom used to always tell me that don't, tell, don't let anybody tell you what to do. So I remembered her earlier advice, and I disregarded her newer advice, and I actually started telling people. I went to campus, and I told a few people, and I realized it was a very traumatic, difficult experience, and I realized I didn't want to come out. I wanted to be out. And I discovered then the first rule of coming out, which is this. If you tell the right people, you don't have to tell everybody else. <laughs> don't know how it worked, but it worked for me. And I told a few people, everyone on campus found out about it. Even one of my law professors, one of my uh, law professors came up to me after the uh, after we had a meeting in his office, and he says to me, leans over in the desk, and he whispers to me, he says, so I hear that you're gay now, is that true? <laughs> and I was shocked, I said, yes, I am, but how did you know? And he told me that one of the other law professors had told him about it, which really surprised me, because for a long time, I'd actually labored under the delusion that the faculty at the Harvard Law School had more important things to do with their time <laughs> than to speculate about the sexual orientation of their students. But I came out, um, and it was, for m the most part, a very positive experience for me with everyone except for my grandmother. And my grandmother finally confronted not me, but my partner in my law school graduation ceremony. While I was on stage receiving my degree, my grandmother had a conversation with him, and she told him that she did not approve of my quote-unquote lifestyle. And she insisted that my partner give to her his mother's telephone number so that she could talk to his mother for some reason. And when I found out about it, I, I confronted my grandmother. I said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And we argued about it for a long time. And my grandmother was raised in the church, and she really believed that what I was doing was wrong, and I was a different person. I told her, I am the same person I was before. The only difference is now I've chosen not to live my life in denial, not to live my life in the closet, not to live my life on the down low, but to be open and honest about who I am. But let me tell you something, things don't always change overnight. My grandmother didn't see eye to eye with me. And it wasn't until years later when I wrote my first book 
I went on a book tour all across the country, and I went to all different cities in L.A. and New York and D.C. and, and went to St. Louis, Missouri, where my grandmother lived. And my grandmother came to the book signing, unbeknownst to me, and brought some members of her very conservative church with her. And they all sat in the first few rows. I wasn't sure what they were going to do or what they were going to say, but they didn't say anything. They didn't do anything right away. And then when I finished my speaking, they came up to me, and I thought they might try to lay hands on me or something. I didn't know what was going to happen next. And finally, they came up to me, and they thanked me. They simply thanked me. And I said to them, what made you come to this event? And they said that my grandmother, my very conservative, traditional Baptist grandmother, invited them to the event. Not only invited them, but she actually printed up invitations, without ever telling me, printed up invitations to the event and gave them out to all the members of the church that she knew. And she gave one to the church announcer so the church announcer could read about it in the bulletin the Sunday before I came to town. My grandmother did all this, and I, I asked her, I said, is this true? Did you do this? And she acknowledged that she had. She told me that she loved me, and she said something that kind of surprised me. She said, the church announcer made a little bit of a mistake in reading the announcement, though. The actual announcement said, the family of Keith Boykin invite you to a book signing for his first book, One More River to Cross, Black and Gay in America. But the church announcer read... The family of Keith Boykin invite you to a book signing for his first book, One More River to Cross, Black and Gray in America. <laughs> and I don't know for sure why the church announcer made that mistake, but I think it's because she assumed it had to be a misprint. It had to be a book about African-American senior citizens instead of African-American LGBTQ people. <laughs> why else would this grandmother in this church be giving out this, this bulletin? But the most important lesson I took from this and the lesson I want to leave with you tonight is this, that people can change. My grandmother changed. I've seen people change. So we all have the capacity to change. And we have to be visible in order to help people to change. And I learned the lesson that I, le that I spoke about in the video presentation, which is from the words of Audre Lorde. This is my favorite quotation in the world. I have it hanging up in the bathroom in my apartment. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. And I want to tell you today that when you dare to be powerful and you use your strength in the service of your vision, then it will become less important whether you are afraid as well. Thank you.